Hi everyone, just a quick note before we start. About four minutes into this episode, Brady's recording software stopped working, and we only had the audio from our video call, although thankfully we had that. So the quality drops a little bit for 15 minutes or so. It's still totally listenable, and at around about the 19 minute mark, we get his local audio again. But apologies in advance for the change in sound, and get ready for a killer episode. Hello and welcome to the Musician's Map podcast. You know how every now and then, a band or an album just jumps out, grabs you by the neck, and demands your attention? Something about it just connects with you, and is immediately added to your high-rotation listening. There were a decent-sized handful of those bands and albums for me last year, and one of them was an album called Maya by a band called Conjurer. The performance, the production, and the songwriting appeal to me in such a visceral way. It was almost immediately one of my favorite albums of last year. Conjurer have been around since 2014 and describe themselves as riff music. Others use metal terms like post, black, sludge, doom, death, whatever they are. They've received endless accolades for the aforementioned Maya and were easily one of the most celebrated bands of 2018 by critics and fans. They've been landing some pretty hefty festival shows and are paused to do some great things in the world of metal. So it's a huge honor to have co-guitarist, co-vocalist, and band manager Brady Deeprose join me on the podcast. And let me say, he really knocks it out of the park. We talk about forming a band, balancing music with your job, being self-managed, working with PR, signing to Holy Raw Records, vocal technique, spreadsheets, his strict approach to Conjurer, the years of hard work that slowly produces huge rewards, and the darkness. You know, the glam metal band from the early 2000s. Here's Brady. So I ended up playing cello for years, actually, and and played in orchestras, ended up playing in Europe. It kind of became the thing that I did until my dad got me into the darkness and I decided guitars were way cooler and (laughs) wanted to learn guitar. So I I started learning guitar at secondary school, uh, which was age like 13. Just a sec, can I just stop you there? The darkness was was a gateway band for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's fucking amazing. I've seen them like 13 times now as well. (laughs) I love the darkness. (laughs) That's so good. That's so good. That is so cool. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think Justin Hawkins is just the absolute man. Yeah. There's no uh, denying that. <laughs> First album as well, Permission to Land. People see them as a bit of a joke, but for me, it's the perfect British rock album. Yep. Just so tongue-in-cheek, but still with an emphasis on good songwriting, which is where I think bands should be <laughs> putting the emphasis. Yeah. Lately, their material's got a little bit more focusing on we're known for being a bit funny, so let's focus on that. It's first couple of records, though, spot on. Yeah, so The Darkness, so that's usually the band where people are like, dude, what, what, the, what the fuck? The, you, you can't be listening to that. And I'm like, come on, sort yourself out. So yeah, so I got to that and was in a number of terrible metalcore bands and a, a pop-punk band, and then... Myself and Dan, the other guitarist, vocalist, started the band just through Facebook chatting. And I'd, I'd been a, a huge fan of his previous band. And they're called Tear of Eden. That's Tear as in like crying and then Eden as in the garden. Um, Whoa. They have an EP on Bandcamp, which you can still listen to, called As the Crows Watch Over Us. And it's fucking wicked. It's a metalcore band wanting to be a melodic death metal band and doing a reasonably okay job, Uh, but it's legitimately wicked. And I I was a huge fan of them for years. And when they split up, it was like, oh my God, Dan from Tear of Eden is talking to me. He wants to start a band. Like, what the shit? I couldn't (laughs) believe it. I I was like a, a fanboy when we started. We both were sick of being in metalcore bands was pretty much the gist of that. And... I just got into Gajira and the Black Dahlia murder and was starting to explore more extreme music. And he was kind of a, a, a couple of years ahead of me being a little bit older. And yeah, we bonded over not playing metalcore sure. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. It developed from there and we got Jan in, who's uh, our drummer, who was the go-to drummer for any band in the Midlands for 
many years. <laughs> it was like, oh, you want to play metal? Yeah, get Jan. Why? He's the guy that can play it. <laughs> it was yeah. it was that simple. And uh, he joined the band because he wanted some exercise. He didn't really <laughs> like the music that much, but he was like, yeah, I don't have anywhere to practice drums. So if I'm rehearsing with you guys and it's going to be metal, then... I'll get better and kind of developed into enjoying the music. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a bassist before our current guy, Connor, uh, who was a friend of ours, Andy. And after we recorded Maya, Connor came in. It's actually really funny. In the first year or so, he used to come to all of our gigs and like essentially roadie for us. But like we used to make him pay petrol money just to come with us and like carry <laughs> our shit. Like it was so bad looking back, but he'd been to as many gigs as the majority of us. So it was a really natural fit when he just came and joined the band. Yep. So that was quite cool. That was the, the Genesis as it were of us, us getting together. Yeah. Uh, it's not a particularly wild story. Actually. I don't think many bands actually are uh, unless you're looking for, hype and to have some big narrative with your band it's just guys get together and start playing some music <laughs> and it's, it's... totally man you'd be surprised about how many people don't know how to start a band and struggle with actually just finding like-minded musicians especially if you live in small towns you know yeah i don't know what's like in new zealand which I, i'm actually quite interested to find out about through this but in the uk it is such a small country that Wherever you are, there is a scene nearby, whether it's good or bad. But like, so w the town I live in, when I was getting into music, 20 minutes north or south, you got to either rugby or Northampton, each of which had their own little metal scene. And then an hour north or an hour south, give or take, Birmingham or London, where there's the bigger scene. So w the bands that do well locally you kind of develop into, oh, we've got a gig in London or we've got a gig in, in Birmingham and, and you kind of branch out like that. So we're very fortunate to live in a country where obviously there's a whole lot of heavy metal heritage and and for, again, outside of metal, I don't have a huge amount of experience, but I, I did play in a pop-punk band and the scene for that was really healthy as well. So there are definitely opportunities to play and there's places to rehearse you know within a half hour drive of wherever you live sure. pretty much so yeah. we are quite lucky in that respect i struggle to imagine what it's like in new zealand because it's such a massive country in length like if you were to drive like end to end like, yeah yeah it's, it's long, insane man. do you have like big scenes there or, or how's, how's it work Kind of. like We have a good metal scene. We've always had a really good metal scene across the country. Our three biggest cities, Auckland, Wellington, and Christchurch, you can live there quite happily and be involved in a scene. Our smaller cities uh, will have small scenes, and our small towns, you kind of have to go to the smaller cities close to you. Similar yeah. thing to England. Obviously, there's not many people in New Zealand. We only have about four and a half million, and a big chunk of those are in Auckland. So Auckland has the best scene. Metal is probably one of the strongest scenes. We used to have a really, really good hardcore scene, but yeah. that's kind of died off, and a really good punk scene, which has sort of died off. But the metal scene goes strong, and you know it's one of those things where there's not really like a metal core scene and a death metal scene and a black metal scene. It's just a metal scene. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> there aren't man. enough bands, so you'll get everyone sort of playing on the same bill. Crazy mixed bills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that's awesome. It is good. Um, I live in a I live in a really small town, and it's about a two hour drive to Auckland. So quite often I'm up there for shows. But yeah, you, you kind of just have to travel, you know. Uh, when Conjurer come over to tour, <laughs> you'll probably get three really, really good shows. It seems people will do Australia and then stop off in New Zealand and yep. maybe on to like Japan or, or somewhere like that. So or kind of vice versa. But yeah. if we get the opportunity to do either of the three, I'd want to make sure that we do the other two as well. Yeah, it's worth it, man. I'd really like to get out there. It's We're going to America for the first time in a couple of months. We actually literally booked our flights about two hours ago. Oh, amazing. Yeah, just the, <laughs> the stress of planning international touring is, is really getting to me. Realizing how much effort actually goes into making this sort of thing happen, it's like... I've done it once now, so I've got the groundwork there to do it again. And and the fact that for us, we're at the point where some of us are having to quit our jobs to go out and do. So we're away for six weeks. And then when we get back, we've got a festival in the Netherlands and the, the next weekend. And then the weekend after that, four dates in Ireland. So we're out essentially for two months and I was made redundant from my job last week. Our drummer's having to quit his job. 
and the other two it's kind of like 50 50 so yeah. we're at that point where it's like well fuck it let's just go out and tour wherever and whenever we can and yeah. you know it's well yeah again we are very lucky in that respect that you know we're, we're at a point in our lives where we can just do that yeah but it's i mean it takes a lot of hard work and there's years of that uh kind of limbo where you're having to work a full-time job and then having to work full-time yeah. on the band at the same time and then it is a full-time job beg your boss or whatever you're doing you know to, to be able to take enough time off work to go to it and then just come back to your job and i think yeah it gets pretty hard you get to the point where i'm looking at part-time work or if i do take on a full-time job i'm going to stipulate that i need to be have flexible unpaid leave and to be able to move around my my working days to fit around playing one-off shows and stuff like that so we've got a couple of one-off festivals this year that i can't talk about yet but we're going to need to take like a thursday and a friday off to get out there and, and things like that so yeah yeah at the minute the way i'm thinking and the way that it seems to be a lot of my friends who are in bigger bands as in bigger than us but not big enough to do it full time yeah they all have numerous part-time jobs that allow them to you know i want to pick up a couple of shifts doing bar work this week and then get some driving work the week after to fit around these shows and vice versa so i think gone are the days realistically within heavy music where unless you're right at the top of the game you can't be looking at it as a career I am very confident that that one day Kundra will be able to make enough money to pay ourselves a little bit. That is not going to be enough to supplement a full-time job. But sure. if I've got four or five part-time jobs and my own little business on the side, plus a little bit of money from the band, then suddenly it's a lot more viable. And it's that kind of lifestyle that is... I think the way musicians are going to have to go going forwards and totally man. And it's that diversification, isn't it? Yeah, and so absolutely. lots of people in your situation, as you say, have their own business. They might do something else artistic and have an Etsy shop or, yeah. they, you know, there might be a tattooist or there might be a sound engineer, or as you say, it might just drive vans. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key is multiple ways of generating an income when you're not actually out making money with the band. Exactly. I'd like to get into, um, touring, doing merch and tour managing and that kind of thing is something that I do for us anyway. So yeah. it's just getting the time to actually make it happen. I think that's the thing with most people. It's so daunting to take your band to the point where, so when we first started, we were doing 50 to 70 gigs a year up and down the, the length and breadth of the UK. Every single weekend we'd be playing shows and we'd be doing weekenders just anywhere and everywhere even we could play yeah we were doing it and that in itself to get to where we've got we wouldn't have done that unless we would played all these shows and now it's like well we're starting to play bigger shows and we've played with bands you know oh, i remember playing with this band two years ago at a shit pub in the middle of nowhere to about four people now we're friends with them and they've invited us to come and play this show or vice versa and that networking from the very first few months of us playing is has been so vital to to getting us to where we are now so i think people need to realize if they want to do this and actually grow the band to an extent that well that wasn't a goal for us but it, it's got to the point you know it's happened mm. if that's something you want to do then the first few years of really hitting it hard with playing shows is essential i think and it's something that not a lot of people can commit to. You know, it, it, it was really difficult for us, but, you, you know, it's the only way, I think, unless you've got shitloads of money behind you, <laughs> yeah. it's the only way you can, you can really do it. Yeah, it's that building your audience from the get-go, isn't it? Yeah, One exactly. show at a time, as you say. And it, I guess yeah. when you've got four members as well, you know, it's trying to find everyone to get the time off work and to organize everything to actually get up there. Oh, it's and horrible. Who's got the van? Oh, none of us. We, so up until late 2018, we would take two or three cars to every show. Oh, shit. It was mad. And then we started, we've got a couple of different drivers now. So when we do the bigger drives, we'll get someone to come drive us, basically. Our fees are just about high enough now to cover that. Yeah. And so we can actually the band is at the point now where we don't actually have to put any money in ourselves as well 
it is completely self-sufficient, which is a point I never thought I would get to with a band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just I'm so used to it being just like a, a money pit that you, you throw all your money into and uh, never see it again. So w- with regards to driving, I, I remember we did uh, our first ever tour was with a band called Sodomized Cadaver from Wales. <laughs> and um, <laughs> they were nice guys. We did from where where we are to Leeds, which is like three hours or four hours with traffic. And then we drove home to a shit town in the centre of Wales, which was like a five, six hour drive. We stayed in a travel lodge. Our bassist drove home, worked uh, 6 a.m. till 4 p.m. and then drove back to Wales to a town 20 minutes from the last town to oh, play another show. Fuck. And these were shows to like literally like 10 people. Yeah. And what we were getting paid like 50 pounds fee, which is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's something. You know, it's better than we were expecting. But again, it's being willing to do stuff like that. Our first basis down, he put in so many hours and he had, he had quite a, a high up like corporate job with a uh, uh, financial auditors so he was literally mr business turned up for gigs in his suit and everything <laughs> and then just like rocked out it was cool yeah not to try and discourage anyone but it is a lot of work but it is the most fun you will ever have <laughs> like yeah. as long as you can be prepared to go and play to no one and see it as a free practice like it's fun and one of the gigs so our old manager who was actually the bassist in quite a big uk band he saw us when we played up north we played a shit little showcase thing at a venue to five people but he was one of those people and we got chatting from then and he ended up managing us and helped get us some festivals and stuff like that so mm you never know who's going to be at those gigs and chances are it's no one, but then, you know, we still get people coming to see us now that saw us in the, you know, 2015 people that were at our first few shows and have just relentlessly come to see us. And it's people like that, that allow you to go on and play festivals and do, you know, all the cool shit that looks good on your Facebook page. Yeah. And that's it, dude. Like I was just about to say, What's the key to keeping up your morale and keeping up the desire when you're doing those five hour trips to play to five people for 50 quid and sleeping on a floor and yeah. repeatedly? But it is that. It's that it just builds upon itself. Those five people mm. will come back next time that you come into town yeah. and bring all their friends. As long as you're not shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're shit, there's, uh, there's, you've got a bit more problems, you know. <laughs> Uh, I think that the actual key to keeping it up is not looking at it like we're analysing it now. I think we were literally just four guys. We had a renewed passion for the music we were making. We finally felt like we were making something that we could all be proud of and, and music that actually got us really excited. Like I remember with previous bands, I'd be like, oh God, I've got band practice tonight. I just can't be bothered i've had a long day at work whereas with Pandora, it was always like fuck yes let's go let's go and do this the, the motivation was there because of the music and that is what allows you to go and play to no one because you're like i fucking love playing these songs and i know that whoever is there is going to love it as well because people feed on that the passion from a band i, I don't think you talk about bands that are like crazy live with their performances and yeah that's also great but you can get that from a band that stands there and does nothing if you see that passion and we're, we're somewhere in between the two we're not like jumping off the ceiling doing your escape plan but we're not shoegazers either it's getting that passion that you feel for the music across in your performance and that is how we played Martha Tidville to 10 people <laughs> yeah and it was wicked and i'd go back and do it again yeah (laughs) that's so true dude that's so true that was crazy actually it was we turned up three hours before sound check and accidentally crashed a funeral uh (laughs) by driving into a church and had to reverse out really quickly while all these people were like staring at us it was horrible sat in the rain for three hours keep getting text from the promoter saying yeah yeah doors are getting pushed back doors are getting pushed back and we were like great when can we load in and we, we eventually loaded in and it was just like a pub 
like it just look like a uh, do you have weather spoons in no in, uh, no but i um, i know weather spoons well yeah. yeah so like a standard chain club it just looked like a spoons and there was this family there and they did not look like they were ready for a, a an ext- <laughs> yeah it was a death metal gig at that point and uh we were just sat there like we all ordered a fry up it was just like cool we'll just sit here and eat some food then and this dude turns up about 10 minutes before doors were meant to be none of the other bands had arrived yet and he was like oh yeah i'm the sound man we're like fuck yeah there is a gig on and he pulls out this huge pa like it was insane pulls all the (laughs) tables across actually ended up being a really cool gig and apparently he's done sound for like iron maiden and uh, uh, (laughs) monsters of rock back in the day and i was like shit this guy yeah it was was cool but you self-manage the band now yeah so um we got to the point where I felt like there wasn't anything our management were doing for us that I couldn't already do or hadn't already done for us. And it got to the point where I was liaising with our, our PR guys and our label and uh, all of this stuff pretty much on a daily basis. I would spend 70% of my day on my computer work, on my Gmail or like scheduling posts on Facebook or, or just dealing with the band admin. Uh, so I got to a point where I, I felt like I was way more passionate about the project than our manager at the time. So we decided and we, we were paying them a percentage of our fees as well, which kind of burnt a little bit while I, I felt I was doing the majority of the work. So we decided to not go in that direction and I took it over so it, it's it's something that I'm really passionate about I don't write <laughs> I don't write much music at all for us so it's it feels like it's my way of contributing to the band sure uh, so I, I think everyone naturally falls into their own role within a band but having someone to deal with this side of things pretty much from day one I was the guy that would talk to the promoters when we got to the show and make sure we got paid and kind of foster those relationships. And if it meant missing a few bands that we were playing with, it was like, well, okay, I've missed those bands, but I've met this guy and and he's introduced me to this woman. And, and then we've, you know, it, those kind of relationships are the only way for your band to do anything other than your local scene. Yeah. It's just, just talking to these people. So that, I adopted pretty much from day one. So it, it's felt like taking on uh, management has been a little bit inevitable and I've, I've had the time realistically to focus on it. And there is always something going on over email every single day. Uh, I'm talking to our RPR guys, hold tight, are insanely good. I, I, I cannot, if you're a UK band that needs PR, talk to Matt Benton at Hold Tight. They've gone above and beyond anything we could have ever hoped. I get daily emails, pitching things, working on things. You know, I, I can contact them at any hours and, and they, they pretty much always get back to me. So mm. it's having that kind of support. Uh, I'm kind of going on a bit of a tangent here, but w- we were playing at 2000 Trees Festival this year, which, have you been to many UK festivals where you lived over here? Yeah, yeah, I've been to loads, yep. Sick, okay, so 2000 Trees, for, for anyone not in the know, is a primarily alternative kind of rock festival. So they had Twin Atlantic headline. This year they've got Yumi at Six and Every Time I Die. And it's it's a mixture of kind of like alternative rock and then a bit of metal, a bit of hardcore, a bit of a bit of everything. Mm. Um we played there and the merch tent was run by a label called Big Scary Monsters, who are a really good UK alternative label. And their boss, Kev, was saying to me, whatever you do with your band and whoever you work, make sure that you surround yourself with people that you implicitly trust to get things done and, and that you can say hand on heart, you know they've got your best interests at heart and you know that they will work as hard as you will on the band. And this was the point at which I felt that I should take over the management because that, that that felt like the one kind of weak link in the chain. So we we have hold tight who do our PR, um, our label, our Holy Raw records who are the best record label in the UK for extreme music. 
from the minute they started working with us and they kind of plucked us out of nowhere before we released our EP, uh, they have been so supportive and they have insane ideas that they're always running by us. They are creative, they're passionate, and if they work with a band, it is because they 100% believe in you and they show that. Mm. When we first got picked up and we were thinking okay you know we'll be a, a little side note for them they'll they'll put out the ep and we, we might get a couple of emails from them but you know fine we're happy to be here it was every day for months we were talking and and they throw everything into to every release they do so it's having both of those two people working in tandem has done more good for this band than anything I could have done. <laughs> so so Holy Raw picked you up for your EP? Yeah. That was your debut EP? Yeah. How did that come about? We had a lot of songs written, and as opposed to doing an album, we felt an EP would be a good kind of foot in the water just to get something out there. We had most of the songs that are on Maya written, or we picked four that we felt would work well as an EP, kind of cohesively, and went to track them with Steve Sears, who is a producer at Titan Studios in Watford, and he did the Gallows record, Desolation Sounds, and the Hang the Bastard Sex in the Seventh Circle records, at which we both were huge fans of the, those records. So mm. um, we went to track with him, and Lewis Johns ended up mixing and mastering the EP. Lewis is, I would say, the in-house producer for Holy Raw Records. He did so many of the of last year's records. They employed to serve Rollo Tomasi, Svalbard. He's just done Renounced. He's done the forthcoming Employed to Serve record. You know, it, it seemed for a while that as soon as Holy Raw released something, it was Lewis Johns on the uh, yeah. production. So he actually hit us up and said, I'd love to work with you. And we were like, well, actually, we've got an EP that needs mixing. So that was purely serendipitous that he happened to contact us. And he really liked us, really liked the record. And he obviously knows Holy Raw really well through that. So we'd been pestering Holy Raw on Twitter with our shit self-recorded demos. <laughs> and they'd uh, Alex told me they'd listened to them and said, yeah, kind of interesting, but, you know, it sounds like shit and there's nothing there. Yeah. Uh, Lewis sent them the record and said, check this band out. And he, uh, Alex really liked us. And it, it, it was as simple as getting an email from him saying, I'd like to put your EP out. Sweet. And we were like, shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it was while we were recording that we kind of really got into Holy Raw. So we were watching videos of Svalbard and Employed to Serve while we were in the studio. And it was like one of those, maybe one day, like 10 albums down the line, Holy Raw will be interested in putting our stuff out. And <laughs> it was a, a real, like the very first, like, holy shit, what's going on moment for us when they, uh, they got in touch. But Alex was saying, and uh, this is something I think that goes for all people within the industry, for them to check out a band there's almost no point just tweeting them or emailing them with your music. They need to hear about you from their friends, from other people in the industry. They need to see your name on posters that ideally they need to see you at a gig supporting one of their bands. Like it's only when you get three or four of those things all happening in tandem that they, that they kind of go, okay, yeah, maybe it's worth checking checking this out yeah i get a lot of people say oh you know can you send my stuff to holy raw or how did you guys get picked up on a label it's like well you need to try and get in front of them without putting yourself in front of them as in you know directly saying yeah. look at us sign us we're great it, there's no point every band thinks they're great it, it's not until other people start saying it, that, that they're going to, you know, you think about the amount of submissions any label or PR company or anything gets. And that similarly, there's a really good article put out by our, our PR company, which is how do I know if I need PR? And it just kind of takes you through the steps of have you done all of this? Have you got to this point? At that point, then you should start to look for that kind of representation. So rather than approaching record labels, you should just focus on working really hard at your music. And when you're ready to sign to a label, labels will probably be already approaching you. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And 
There's a lot to be said for record labels. We were fully prepared to self-release the EP and just get it out there and, and try and get some many people. You look at a band, are you familiar with Frontera? Yeah. Yeah, so those guys, for anyone not so in the know, are uh, another UK insanely heavy band, but everything they do is self-release all through Bandcamp and they have a huge following. They, you know, they, they do festivals, they do everything, and that is because... They have this ethos, which the way I approach the band is, is very much how I'm assuming they do, which is quality over everything else. So quality over profit, quality over ease. Like we print all of our merch on Gildan Ultra, which is the, the more expensive version of the standard heavy, which is what everyone uses. Yeah because they are nicer quality shirts and they last longer. And we use a company called Pins and Knuckles who are amazing and international uh, who do all of our merch printing. They print a higher quality of print and we go to reputable people to design our merch and our artwork and stuff like that because, yeah. Yeah, and you know, we pay very good money to get that done because what that equates to is three years after you've released a t-shirt you still see people wearing it i get messages from my friends when they go to festivals and they're like i've seen like 15 people wearing your band's t-shirt today and it's like well yeah because that is the one out of their closet that hasn't faded and the design has stood up well because it's been you know there's been a lot of effort put into it and i've spoken to people in bands that have been like oh yeah we paid like 50 quid to get our match design and i was like dude we spent like 300 pounds on a long sleeve design recently and we've sold an insane amount of them you yeah. know it's the effort and the money that you put into things is directly related to the the success of those things and w with regards to songwriting we will write and rewrite and rewrite again a song until it's perfect. And then we, we will rehearse it until we're absolutely sick of it. And it's only then that you start to get that reputation for consistency, which I think is the most important thing. I've been in bands before where the singer has been like, well, I'll design the t-shirts and I've got a mate that will print them really cheap. And it's like wicked. We have a hundred t-shirts and it's cost us 200 pounds but they're crap and people don't actually want them. You get a few people that will buy them because they like your band and they want to support you or your mates, but you're not actually giving people something that's worth their money. And until we have to, we won't charge more than £10 for a T-shirt because we don't need to. We don't make much money on that, but we have been at gigs and you see like 20 five pounds 30 pounds 40 pounds for a t-shirt and yeah. it is i know whoever's taking a cut of that i know you don't need to charge that much yeah. and it, it's that principle and and people are like how do you guys sell so much merch it's like well we make it really good and we make it as cheap as we can there's no like secret formula to it and and you're representing yourself you know you're representing the band in all of these different ways exactly your music videos your recordings your merchandise yeah uh, everything and if they're shit <laughs> if any aspect is shit it represents the band in that way exactly and so as a music consumer as a music fan when you're looking around for new bands mm. if something stands out as being really good quality whether it's you know the songwriting the artwork whatever you're immediately a little bit more drawn to that because people want to be associated with that good quality product right yeah exactly i, I feel like it's such a an obvious thing for me it's been since day one but the amount of bands that i see that have just put seemingly like no care or attention into one of those aspects uh, when we were saying before we went to the studio we would rather wait six months and lose all of our momentum if it meant that we could save up to record a record that sounds as good as we need it to yeah it's just such a no-brainer yeah but it comes down to that money though right yeah and that's where oh, people yeah, stumble it's... they don't want to spend you know five grand on a recording they want to spend no, no one bucks. does no 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 one does i mean <laughs> yeah. and like i've done it a couple we of times and you know you don't want to do it but 
it just comes down to that. Most people, they don't want to go and spend 300 pounds yeah. on a t-shirt design. They want to spend 50. Yeah. It's just if you're prepared to work, to save, to sacrifice that money for the band. Exactly. That, that's what it was. It was the amount of money we put in us. We never kept track of it. And I'm so glad because it would be such a depressing statistic <laughs> if I yeah. found out how much money I put into this band from, <laughs> from day one. But again, none of it was wasted because if, you love your music and you love performing live and that is your hobby and you see it as your hobby, then justifying paying for it isn't an issue. You get people that will go out and spend hundreds of pounds on Warhammer or remote control cars or whatever their thing is. That That's just, oh, that's their thing. If your thing is being in a band, then you need to invest in that. Yeah. It means paying to practice every week. We practice every single week. Like mm. still, and we have done since we started. For it was three hours a week for the first two, three years. Now it's two hours a week because we're pretty much just going over the same set list. But we pay for that every week, and we used to pay for studio time, petrol. And when you're first gigging, you know, you know, it's like you don't get any money. You get a little bit of money to cover your petrol. You certainly don't get any um, food or anything like that. But it's your hobby, and it's only in the last year or so that we've yeah 2018 i say was comfortably where we didn't have to pay for our own petrol money we didn't have to pay for uh, most of the time we don't have to pay for our own food at, at shows and suddenly oh okay we're doing a lot more so it's taking up more time we're earning less money but it's costing us less money as well sure. so as you grow those kind of benefits do become apparent it's still difficult and it's yeah but it does get easier and you do as long as you're genuine and I think if it's really obvious when people are just chasing fame, <laughs> no, you wouldn't be doing this kind of music if you're chasing yeah. <laughs> fame, but you know, if you're just chasing that, that sort of thing and you're not doing it because you fucking love it, then it is obvious to people and yeah. it becomes a little bit sad, I think. But if you're genuine about it and you have good quality control, then you can get to the point where, it's a hobby that doesn't really cost you that much, which yeah. is amazing. And then you start to play abroad and you're like, oh no shit, now it's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. When when did you start working with Hold Tight? Hold Tight did the PR on art. And was it was that at the advice of Holy Raw or was that just you guys? So Holy Raw do their own PR except for bigger releases or if they're really busy. So they did, Holy Raw did the PR for our EP and we started working with Hold Tight uh, a few months before the album came out and that was we wanted to go with an external PR agency just because we wanted to give it a bit more of a push and not that we didn't think Holy Raw could have done it and they've done really well but they'd just done the Helpless record which got in like the Daily Sport which is is a, a massive like UK newspaper that should not have a grindcore record in it <laughs> but so Hold Tight did a really insanely good job with them and Holy Raw used them anyway, so it felt like a uh, a solid plan. Yeah, we were actually advised against going with them. They felt like the right people to go with to us, and yep. we spoke to them a lot. And it, it just it felt right. Our label, who we did trust, said go for it. So so we started working with them, and immediately it was all hands on deck, and they were much more reasonable than a lot of the other quotes we'd had in for PR. Is that like a monthly commitment or is it a percentage commitment? What sort of thing is it? It works on, I think it's different for everyone. Yep. They originally did it per month for the album campaign and actually it ran over a little bit. So they did us a deal on, on that and now they charge us because we've said regardless of what happens, we work with you going forwards now so they are now doing kind of like festival season and then we'll put together an invoice for a tour or a couple of tours so they are very much catered to the size of your band the amount of work needed and then the amount of activity you've got so it's not sure. like there is a blanket price that we will charge Slipknot and we will charge your local pub covers band they're much smarter about it than that, which is nice. And it feels like 
to get to that point, they have to really evaluate everything about your band and know what the plan is, kind of where it's going to go, what they're expecting. So there's a lot of effort that goes in before you start working with them, which is, again, really nice. Little things like this, like this podcast, I, I get an email from them saying, you've been asked to do this, do you want to come get involved? And, mm. and this is outside of a period that we're really working with them. So they've they've kind of kept up to date and will still filter bits and bobs for us. So yep. I've, I've uh, sucked them off quite a lot <laughs> so far. But when you get to a certain point, I think that the benefits of a really good PR person far outweigh the costs. Yeah. just above and beyond just any of the press coverage which you guys have had a ton of press coverage as well yeah they did an incredible job yeah it's been crackers it comes down to what you were saying before about the advice you received to work with people that you trust that feel right yeah exactly i know i've been in situations where i've worked with people and maybe there's been something just <laughs> nagging in the bottom of your yeah. gut and you're like this doesn't feel a hundred percent like everything on the surface looks really good but it doesn't really feel like a hundred percent and then what do you know <laughs> eventually you know <laughs> something comes out and yeah every, every time i've had that feeling about anything it's been it's been well, whether it's you get offered a tour or you get asked to do a show and you're like this seems cool but this promoter has been a bit yeah, weird yeah, yeah, every yeah. time they're weird like yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> oh, the, i think people's like online manner will get people that will send us an email that says can i book your band and I will reply saying, please contact our booking agent because his details are on the Facebook where you obviously got this email address from. And then they'll say, cool. And then they'll send me a personal message on Facebook say, oh, did you get my email? I'm trying to book your band. And then they'll send the band a Facebook message saying, I'm trying to book your band. Can you? And it's like, that is the kind of stuff that makes people think, I don't want to work with you because yeah. wait for a reply. Give people a week to get back to you and send a formal follow-up that doesn't say sent from my iphone on the bottom and just have yeah. a load of random spam on it like <laughs> if people want to work with you whether that's a band contacting a label a band contacting a promoter a promoter contacting a band anything you do send a formal email and then follow up formally like a week later there's just that is something that i learned because i used to pester people all the time and wonder why i didn't get replies sure. and, and then it was only through experience and learning that myself it's like oh okay that that's actually really annoying for people yeah the people are professionals and actually have a lot of work to do and you <laughs> yeah. can't just you yeah. know constantly be on the ball answering everything yeah. now yeah yeah exactly um so dude what's next for conjurer i mean you guys have, have obviously just been through a, a huge uh, growth period and you've been doing loads yeah. of shows and now you've i guess you're booking festivals and tours for the upcoming summer yeah, yeah. So we've never really done any headline shows. So we're doing uh, four headline shows next month. Uh, so that that'll be really cool. It's going to be it's quite nerve wracking for us because we still don't feel like we've got enough clout to do a headline show. I still like whenever we talk about it, I'm like, yeah, but is anyone going to turn up? Like, does, <laughs> does anyone care? Like, yeah. So we're doing that. Our first show of the year is next week with uh, Milk Teeth, who are. Uh, grunge yeah. alternative band on, yeah. on Road I, I saw Runner. that lineup and um, thought it was strange so, so yeah we're, we're doing the show with Milk Tea headline show is Complexity Fest which is a tech metal festival essentially based in the Netherlands which again we love just playing all these like crazy bills and then we go to America for a month which is uh, a, month? a, a logistic oh, so rad. yeah so it, it's 34 shows in 39 days yes uh, we have never played more than nine shows in a row, so <laughs> I have uh, no idea how my voice is going to Yeah, cope. I was just going to say, how are your voice is going to hold up on that? Our last tour was November, and we did nine shows, and it was the first time neither of us had lost our voice in a run of shows, so I think we're starting to get the technique down where we're not damaging ourselves, yeah. which is nice. My plan at the minute is just not to think about it and then just do it. Yeah. So I know it's not a very um, sensible way to deal with it, but... Do you do coaching or anything for your vocals or do you do you work on your sort of technique in that way i didn't to start with we just didn't want to get anyone else in the band so we decided to do it neither of us had done vocals before i used to lose my voice quite a lot and you slowly start to work out what works for you and what doesn't um and then when we played euroblast this guy was like i'm doing free 
heavy vocal coaching. Do you want me to do a session? And we were like, fuck yeah. So he came and hung out in the van with us and did a, um, a lesson on false chord vocals, which have been, yeah. I think beneficial, like again, since that, neither of us have really struggled with our, our voice as much. And I still haven't nailed the technique, but it seems to be working. Yeah. And then I thought I've got a massive spreadsheet, which is our uh, upcoming shows. Oh yeah, it's got a list of every show we've ever done on it as well, which is quite nice. And I, I keep a list of like <laughs> yeah. uh, all the bands that we've played with and everything. So awesome. all the sport bands. Like, oh, oh, I love that. Them there. That's organization, man. I make Google Documents is yeah. my best friend in the world. Like yeah. we use it for everything. Like our uh, spreadsheet here. Let me talk you through this. I don't think anyone's... <laughs> I've never talked about this in an interview before. I've had that exact spreadsheet. Oh, man. Yeah, so I've got date, uh, what day of the week it is, city, venue, what the event is, whether it's been confirmed, whether it's been announced, uh, number of advanced sales if I'm promoting it or if it's a headline show, entry cost, link for advanced tickets, link for the Facebook event page, what gear we need, what time loading is, sound check, our set time, doors curfew fee commission on our fee to our booking agent what rider there is if there's accommodation guest list what bands are playing who the promoter is and their contact details holy shit dude that's so, incredible oh listen up listen up people that's the way yeah. so if someone in the band says what's happening for the next few months i just say <laughs> check the spreadsheet yeah. and they go in and then it's got like uh, for other shows it's got another tab with if you need anyone on the guest list for a show, you add them on there. And then when I get to the venue, I just look on the spreadsheet. And so this is the guest list. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any dates, someone's unavailable for a show. And then I link to all the past shows, which was first show was uh, 1st of February, 2015. Wow. But yeah, that, that spreadsheet has been an absolute lifesaver. And uh, is there anything, any kind of advice that you'd give to musicians starting out especially in bands maybe especially in metal bands that we haven't kind of covered the main thing is work with people you trust and i think especially when you're rehearsing when you first start you don't know a song until you know every individual part we'll get into a practice and say right go from the third bridge of behold the swine click 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 and we play it you need to know every aspect of every song inside out, play it to death until you're absolutely fucking sick of it because then you can focus on your performance. When when you're just playing a song kind of from instinct, mm. that is when you can work on your performance. And I see so many bands where, or I've played in bands as well, where I know, is the drummer going to get this fill and are we going to go out of time or am I going to remember this solo? And whereas Kundra, it is like, I know every single person is going to nail every single part of every single song. I don't even need to think about it. I can just enjoy playing it. And we did not get to that point straight away. It took a couple of years and really we, we should have rehearsed more. But if you can get as close to that point when you're starting off as possible. Yeah it will put you in so much better stead uh, for going forwards and um, don't settle for anything less than exceptional. If you don't hear something or see something and think, fuck, that's amazing. That is exactly what I wish my favorite band was doing. Then by all means, go ahead and do it, but don't expect other people not to have a reaction like that. If you don't have it yourself. Yeah. Whenever we do something new, I think, fuck, this is wicked and get really excited about it. And, that is the only way you can expect people to have any passion for your your project. The passion comes from you first and then hopefully other people. Dude. And if it doesn't, don't complain. Just keep doing it because if you've got that passion there, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks because you're having a great time. Yeah. And that's all for this episode. A giant thank you to Brady for being so awesome and sharing so much on the podcast. Make sure to check out Conjurer. You'll find links to all their pages in the podcast description and on the Musicians Map website. Brady chose two artists of the week. The first is God Complex, and the second is Prestamico. You'll also find links to their music in the podcast description. So I hope you all enjoyed that episode. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, don't forget to like the podcast on whatever medium you listen to. Share it around with your friends. That's probably the most important thing. 
Share it with other musicians and people that you know. Share it with your bandmates. The more people that can get this advice and information, the better. Uh, and make sure to leave a review if you do that kind of thing. Uh, and look out for the next episode coming very soon. Uh, I've already lined up a couple of amazing guests, so more Musicians Map in the pipeline. Talk soon. This podcast and the website musiciansmap.org is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about community, honesty, and positive progress. The experiences, stories, and advice shared on the podcast are given freely with the hope that you can relate to them and benefit from them. If you've found this podcast enjoyable or useful, make sure to check out the Musicians Map ebook and audiobook about building success in music. You'll find it at musiciansmap.org forward slash books, Amazon, and Audible. And buying a copy of the book directly contributes to the continuation of this podcast. There's also a free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want to get in touch and say hello, please do so via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. Thanks for listening and stay positive. <laughs>